I'm Mary Plenity. I'm the Dean Direct of the uh, Assistant Dean of Academic Technology at the University of Maryland School of Law. And our uh, topic uh, today is how we, in one year, achieve 100% effective use of cl a classroom management system, in our case, Blackboard, by all of our faculty, including all of our adjunct faculty and all of our permanent faculty. I say that, and it still amazes me, because that's not what we set out to do. All right? It just happened, and we discovered that some of the things we were doing, for us, we were apparently doing right. And so what I'm here to talk about this morning is the hope that some of the things that we did might have some application to your school. A couple of disclaimers. I have no more staff than you do. I have no more money than you do. All right, and my faculty are just as much like herding cats as your faculty are, all right? We did have one powerful impetus going for us, and that is that we are, as a matter of fact, as soon as I get home this afternoon, we are starting a move into a brand new law school facility. So our faculty were frightened, all right? That is a powerful impetus to learning something new. However, having said that, I think that a lot of the things that we did were actually set in motion well before this move. So, let's look at some faculty issues to begin with. Uh, we have some of the more traditional faculty issues, but what I'm going to talk about today are looking at some things in a new way, looking at some issues in a new way. I may say some things that may be controversial in this group because I don't know exactly who is in the audience, but trust me, I'm not trying to say anything to offend anyone, and uh, hopefully you can look honestly at some of your own faculty issues. The first one, and the foremost one, is trust. All right? Everybody says, well, it's because the faculty are afraid of technology. Well, that's not all they're afraid of. All right, they have to trust someone to help hand over their classes. We're talking about something radically different than just learning email. When you're talking about a course management system, a faculty member is handing you the responsibility to help them teach in a different way. And that's something powerful. The second faculty issue is training. How do you accomplish training in a manner that it sticks? All right? The third is support. What kind of support are you going to offer them and the students so that uh, midway through the semester they don't feel as though you've oversold what a system can do for them? And the fourth is time. Uh, our faculty, and I include myself among them, have the best of intentions and are not always wonderful on follow-up just because the time is not there. So what do we do about that? Okay, so the first faculty issue that I want to expand on is trust. This is not just new software you're asking them to learn. This is a class. And when you have notions of helping them teach in a new way, that means that you're looking at problems with academic freedom, you're looking at problems with copyright issue, you're looking at who do they let in to that classroom, who has the ability to see what they do. We know a lot of things that are fairly frightening about this to faculty. So you have to come up with the understanding of that. Are you, if you are the person who is going to help them with it, are you in the faculty members corner? All right. Uh, I'm both faculty, I'm also an administrator, that means I'm only 50% trustworthy, <laughs> and so you have to get over sometimes who, what it is, you, they're letting an administrator into their class. It's just the same as if you walked in the door and were sitting at the back of the room every day. And so what is it, are you in their corner? And why should you tell them how to teach law? Especially if the person who's doing the training with them does not have a law degree. It can be accomplished by somebody without a law degree. 
But why should you tell an experienced teacher the best way to teach law? That's a big issue. Okay, the training issue. Can the training be personalized for them? Can they work through it themselves? All right? Other faculty issues, support. What happens if there's an emergency? Faculty and law students work on Sundays. They work on Sunday evenings. They work on Monday morning at 5 a.m. Who's available for them? Who best knows what they want when they want it, especially if it's a faculty member with whom you've had very little um, interaction prior to this time? Time. I'm here to teach law, not to keyboard. Guess what? They're absolutely right. All right? I think the training programs which set themselves up so that you're going to try to teach every faculty member to be able to do this all by themselves inevitably will fail. Is this going to be less work? The answer is absolutely not. All right? This is going to be more work. And so, is the result going to be worth their investment? All right, you can't control the institution's payoff for doing something new and teaching something new, unless you're the dean, which I'm not. What you can help them with, and the payoff for our faculty, and I cross my fingers a little bit, on this until the student evaluations came out. We have extremely experienced teachers who saw their student evaluations skyrocket up. And that was a huge payoff for them. Just before I got here, I had an email from one of our senior faculty members, you know, fine scholar, someone who's taught for years, brilliant man, but the students always hit him for what they perceive to be his lack of organization. They can't follow him in class. He put together one of the best Blackboard websites I've ever seen. This is a man who two years ago did not do his own email. I mean it. And his course evaluations were glowing. And he was so happy, I got the nicest email I've ever had. He ran down to tell the dean. Um, and this sort of thing happens over and over. All right? Now, I'm not saying that course evaluations are always glowing whenever there is a cultural change. But on the other hand, the best payoff that you can help them with is how the students respond to them. That's a real payoff, and it is something with which you can assist. Okay, things that work for us. The first thing is you check your ego and your territory at the door. Are you whom does the faculty trust? This is a really, really a hard one. Because whenever you're talking about training, you have a whole lot of people now who would like to be part of that. The IT people would like to be part of that. The library staff would like to be part of that. In our particular institution, my department, Academic Technology, stands by itself. We, however, have a really good working relationship with both IT and with the library, which is very important. I was at one point a research librarian for this school, all right? So the faculty trust me in that way. And I've also worked uh, as an academic technology director at another school. But the point, and this is more important than exactly whose territory it is, is that whoever is making the decision about who starts this program needs to sit down and evaluate honestly who the faculty work with well. Let the faculty tell you whom we want to teach them. Unless you're afraid of the answer. Right? And I got some surprising answers as to whom they want to teach them. Do not begin with faculty technology gurus, 
never begin with faculty technology gurus because most of the faculty turned them out, turned them out a long time ago. <laughs> and they know it, and the rest of the faculty know it. You want to, in my phrase, teach an old dog a new trick. You're going to do one-on-one -on -one training. And don't groan, I know how horrific that sounds, but it's going to have to be one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to have to create faculty control support teams. You want, to, again, faculty comfort level with what you're doing is everything. So they should be able to work with the people with whom they've always worked. That's another clue as to who it is they want to train them. Privacy and academic freedom. Support them. We have a policy in our school now that no one, not the dean of students, not the big dean, gets into a Blackboard classroom without the permission of the instructor. That was a big selling point. Um, that policy came out and I had 10 new faculty sign up the next day. Uh, I mean, I, I'm setting up something here. It's not so much that you've got real hostile groups or issues. You simply have a faculty comfort level. Again, it's trust. You need quick, cheap, I'm calling it 24-7 emergency help, but it doesn't always have to be 24-7. It's your school's 24-7. What are the faculty work patterns? What are the student work patterns? In our school, it's not so important to have somebody available on Saturday evening because nobody works on Saturday evening. It is extremely important to have somebody available from 8 a.m. on Sunday until 8 a.m. on Monday. Okay? And we came up with a low-cost plan for doing that. The other components for success are student pressure. If something's working really well in one class, the students will speak up. You don't have to push the faculty, and you don't have to mandate. The students who are in one class will do it for you. All right? I never did a presentation to the entire faculty where I presented Blackboard. We started with 10 first people who taught in the first year, and one large seminar. By the third week, we had half the faculty, just because of the students. By the second semester, we had 100% of the faculty. The students will do it for you. Okay, ego, territory, and trust. With whom, what I'm going to present are a list of things that you should think about when you're trying to decide who should train this, who should train and who should run. With whom does the faculty have a good relationship? Ask them. Who understands best how they teach? And by that I'm saying both somebody who understands how law gets taught, but someone who also understands ways in which other disciplines use electronic tools. Because as we all know, law is sort of at the rear. You don't have to have a graduate degree in instructional technology. It would be really nice if somebody went out and took a course just to see what the rest of the world is doing. And I've said that. Who has taken education courses? Who isn't afraid of them? That's, that's important. Uh, sit and watch an interaction between a faculty and a staff member. And even the most gentle faculty, at some point there's a tone in their voice that is, um, it's very difficult sometimes for staff to say no to a faculty member. It's some, also difficult for some staff to say yes to faculty. Uh, look, at who, look at who has, who isn't afraid of them, and who has a good report who's willing to make working with the faculty a priority. So it's not just one-time training, but who's willing to make working with them a priority? And who's willing to cut them some slack? 
I mean that. Who is not going to get a bit out of shape when a faculty member misses a training session? All right, who instead is going to go down to their office and say, oops, didn't we have a training session now? And not just wait in the training room in a huff. <coughs> who is willing to cut them some slack? Okay, old dogs, new tricks. I believe very, very strongly in this. We target tenured faculty members who are respected scholars. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I work with the younger faculty. You don't want to work with people who are on tenure track for this. I'm not saying you ignore them, but they're not the people that you target. People who are on tenure track have a whole lot of other things on their minds. A lot of things. What you need to do are to work with the people that they're modeling themselves after. And you don't necessarily want to work with the people that are considered to be, quote, unquote, the best teachers. Go for the people who are the, 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 considered to be the most productive scholars. Those are the people. Target faculty who are not known for their tech savvy. The idea, if this person can do it, I can do it. As I said, the gentleman who emailed me is someone who did not even do his own email two years ago. Publicize their accomplishments to the other faculty, not your accomplishments. That's very important. This is not all about you. It's about them. My office puts out a bi-weekly newsletter that's called Tips from Your Colleagues, and it just talks about how other people on the faculty are using technology to teach. So the idea is that the faculty will go to them, and they can be a resource for each other. And I try very hard to pick, first of all, someone who has not already been profiled, and I also try to pick, as I said, someone who's not known for their tech savvy. And that works really well. Yes, ma'am. Are you? Oh, you're just stretching. Hi. Okay. Hello. Okay. 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 Faculty should direct what happens online. Faculty should communicate with students online. Faculty should not necessarily spend their time scanning, converting documents, or doing anything else that support staff traditionally would have done. I'm going to talk a lot about teaching support staff and faculty-directed teams. But I think that when faculty say, I'm paid to teach law, not to be my own administrative assistant, as I said, they're absolutely right. You want faculty communicating with the students online. Or not spending the time learning how to convert things. I'll teach them if they want to learn, but they don't have to. Okay, give them ideas, but match the idea to the teaching style. For example, um, I'm going to step outside the realm of course management systems for just a second because I think that this uh, has some application to some other areas about teaching with technology. Uh, there are a lot of faculty members who want to learn PowerPoint, and there are a lot of faculty members who are opposed to it because they think it dumbs down the teaching of law, or that it reduces what happens in their classes to simply a series of slides. Um, the people who don't like working with PowerPoint tend to be the same people who write on the board a lot. Uh, something that we have found very successful this year is rather than my trying to convert those people to PowerPoint, instead we use a system called Mimeo. Mimeo converts any regular whiteboard into an electronic board. It saves what they're writing on the board to a laptop computer, and it turns their own drawings that they have worked on in the class into a series of PowerPoint slides for the students. So all I have to do is to upload those to the system at the end of the class. The students get their PowerPoints. The faculty are happy because it reflects in an interaction between them and the students. The point of this is that you're going to have to spend a little bit of time 
with the faculty member figuring out how they teach and how they like to teach. So you're putting them in control still. Game is part of the academic dean. This is crucial. The academic dean is the faculty, well, I, that must be an academic dean back there, okay. Um, the academic dean is the faculty member's representative in the administration. Okay. While it is important to have the dean's support, I think it's crucial to have the academic dean's support for teaching with technology. And not always because you want the academic dean to stand up and mandate the faculty will use something because they won't do that anyway. But it's because the faculty member can get you opportunities to stand up at a faculty meeting and say, so and so professor is teaching an online makeup class uh, next week and has said that if any of you want to sit in and see how he does it online, he'd be happy to have you sit in on it. Uh, would you like to talk about that? I mean, you, the academic dean can give you ways to reach faculty that you may not be able to do so otherwise, except with a mass email, and we all know how well faculty read mass emails or read handouts, all right? The other thing is that I'm also a strong believer in that if you want to reach the faculty, you better try teaching if you can. And the academic dean can help you do that. If you want to teach, and you want to teach whether it's a skills course, whether it's a clinical course, or whether it's a stand-up course, the academic dean is the person who can help you do that. A lot of the, thing, the ideas that I try with other faculty, I try in my own course first, because I'm not about to ask them to do something that I haven't road tested. training. I'm asking you to make the investment of the time for a variety of reasons. And, and I know how horrendous this is. I have 65 full-time faculty. I have another 42 adjuncts. And every last one of them got one-on-one -on -one training in Blackboard for an hour with me. It was the worst month and a half of my life. <laughs> However, it meant that I had FaceTime with every last one of them. It meant that they knew exactly to whom, who to call if they were going to have problems. It also meant that they could ask me questions without anybody else being in the room. And those questions were their own questions. <laughs> Faculty learn differently from each other. I mean, we've already said that students learn differently from other students, so why should we assume that faculty all learn in the same way? Uh, even when I do group presentations to faculty, what I do is to almost to make them like an appellate argument. You have a presentation to get through, but you expect to be stopped by questions because the questions are vitally important. So if I'm going to do that, I might as well do it one-on-one -on -one and spend the time answering the questions. All right, again, it assists in faculty comfort level. The questions won't always be the same. You get to gauge by the questions what the faculty expertise is. You get, the faculty member feels much more comfortable stopping you saying, I don't understand if they're the only person in the room. This, again, this is also a trust issue. And faculty in groups are less responsive. When I have done group faculty training, and by the way, I love my faculty. I mean, I am not denigrating them at all. But I used to, when I started out teaching in the 19, uh, early 1970s, I taught ninth graders. Faculty in groups are like ninth graders. They really are. Uh, you have the guys in the back who are whispering and uh, and drawing and not paying attention, and you have the class clown who says something that everybody else laughs at. And uh, it's fun, but it's not particularly productive. One on one, or maybe two or three, always works better. 
Okay, faculty directors and your teams. This is the heart of what saved our lives after the initial training. I believe very strongly the faculty need to have someone they can call instantly. It should be someone who they have, whom they have worked with for a long time, and it should be someone who knows their work style. It should be someone who's used to correcting problems in their documents. First thing is the faculty, secretaries, and administrative assistants. When I said it was the worst month and a half of my life, the best two weeks of my life was training the administrative assistants. How to work in Blackboard because they got it instantly. All right? Every faculty member has their own person that they can go to. And when, um, one of the things that I discovered is that administrative assistants love this. It's far more creative than what they usually get to do. It's a brand new skill, which means that they get to work for the, through the internet. They get to help convert documents and scan documents. It makes them more valuable, especially now that faculty members are starting to do some of their own training, which is frankly making some administrative assistants crazy. Yes? So this implies that the faculty member, secretary, or administrative assistant has full rights to the Blackboard course as a surrogate for the faculty member. Exactly. Exactly. Now, what does that mean? Now, all of my faculty can do their own email and do work with their own email. I am aware that in a variety of other schools, there are still the holdouts who will not use their own email. My response is, fine. Let their administrative assistant do, do it for them. You know they're comfortable with that because they already do it. If they're not reading their own email, it means that someone else is reading it for them. And that's usually their administrative assistant. And that's usually someone who's worked with them for years, knows all of their quirks, they know all their quirks or his quirks, and it, it just works out better for them. Um, and, our, uh, and our administrative assistants by and large loved it. At first they thought it was going to be a lot more work for them. It turned out to be considerably less work for them. Because again, all they do is put up documents, convert documents, and sometimes send mass emails through Blackboard. The faculty still work with the bulletin boards. The faculty still post announcements. You know, I mean, it would be wrong to say that the administrative assistants do all of the work. They just do the work that the faculty doesn't want to do. Okay? Research assistants. All research assistants get trained in Blackboard. That's also powerful. We have two different classes of research assistants. We also have teaching assistants for some of the first large, first year large courses. Blackboard has several levels of uh, several levels of rights, so I don't have to give a, a teaching assistant or a research assistant all of the rights that the faculty has in order for them to help the faculty. I can make them course builders, which means they can still post documents and they can still send mass emails to the faculty member, but they can't get in and, and mess around with some of the underlying structure of the course. Librarians. One of the best things that we've been able to do for some of our courses is that uh, we have an advanced writing requirement, cert paper. I know that most, if not all, of you do as well. And so what we have been able to do for the seminars is to bring in the librarians as part of the faculty support team in Blackboard so that the librarians have created research guides for those courses that are posted in Blackboard. And our librarians actually come into Blackboard once a week and hold office hours online for the students so that they can discuss with individual students how their cert paper research is coming if the student for some reason can't get in to see them live. So that's made them an incredibly powerful member of the team too. Now, I want to, at the beginning, the faculty member gets to tell me who they want in the team. All right, if there's somebody they don't want in the team, that person doesn't get in. All right, but 
most, if not all, of the faculty members felt that the librarians were an integral part of the team, certainly for the seminars, because uh, they perform a very, very valuable function that the faculty member doesn't always want to take on. Okay, okay. the little topic once you get started. I said nobody accesses a virtual classroom without faculty permission. Absent, there is a caveat to that. Absent extraordinary circumstances. All right. I still ask anyone who needs to get in, whether it's the registrar or the dean of students, and it could be for a variety of reasons. Just go to the faculty member first and tell them that you want to get in or why you want to get in. You wouldn't walk into their classroom unannounced if it's not an emergency. So why would you do this? That seems to make perfect sense to people. Handle copyright issues directly with the faculty with no advertising. I mean, you're going to find when you start putting things up online that the faculty are going to come up with all kinds of interesting things that they've been giving out for years and they may not be aware of the copyright issues, which are multiplied when you put them up online, even if it is in a classroom with passworded access. And so uh, I make it a habit that if there is something that's posted, I handle it with the faculty member, we do it discreetly, we take it down, I don't tell anybody. All right? I mean, it's just that simple. The point is to get it to the to, to get them to recognize that it's a problem, not to make a case out of it. Spot check for problems. Don't let the faculty down. You know, if I'm asking them to put their stuff online, uh, I get up at uh, 5:30 every morning, get myself a cup of coffee, and go to the surf blackboard from home and just see what people have done in the past 24 hours. I make a habit of checking at least 20 to 30 percent every morning. Yeah. So in, in order to avoid violating your first rule, you've gotten blanket permission from the faculty member? Well, the faculty know that they get me no matter what. <laughs> I mean, I'm the administrator. Okay. I'm the administrator. So the first rule is no one except the administrator. Right. Well, they, they, they understand that. They understand that they get me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they, that's, that's just the way it is. But it means that I have to be their sentry. I have to say, no, you can't come in unless you go talk to the faculty member. I may run the system, but I'm not letting you in. Okay? I get to be their gatekeeper. That's why I made the comment that you sort of have to be in their corner. What happens if at least one faculty member says you cannot be in? Uh, that faculty member can't do it then because I'm a system administrator. I mean, it's not that I look, but they have to understand that if I set up the system, I, I still have rights. Right. I've never had a faculty member say that. As a matter of fact, most of them are quite comfortable with it uh, just because they figure that I'm going to clean up after them. That's why I said they have to trust you. I have two questions. Yes. One, does your school um, utilize Blackboard in an institutional way different from the right of any individual person? to create a Blackboard page by going to Blackboard's page and signing up by him or herself. Okay. Um, we don't use the commercial Blackboard system. We use it in-house. It's loaded on our server. Uh, to me, that, well, there are two reasons for that. Uh, there's the first classic. It means that we're not, uh, uh, our faculty do not use the Lexus version, and they don't use Twin. Um, the reason they don't do that is uh, because we're not crazy about being tied to one vendor in that particular way. But there's another reason that I think is far more valid. Maryland has a huge clinical program. A lot of our clinicians, a lot of the students, put fat client um, logs uh, on Blackboard. Uh, the Maryland bar takes a very dim view of us putting up any information about a client on a server that's not in our control. That has twin out, at least for our clinical classes. So that's why we went to running Blackboard ourselves. And by the way, we do run Blackboard ourselves. We do not use the Canvas Blackboard. Ours is just all run in house. Yes? Uh, that gets to something I'm going to If one, as we do, uses the Canvas Blackboard in order to begin with this, um, mm -hmm. 
how difficult, assuming good relations between the law school and the campus in that area, how difficult would it be for me to get <laughs> status over law faculty blackboards? Um, it's not impossible, assuming excellent relationships between you and <laughs> of rights. I mean, you could be put in as a second instructor mm -hmm. in their courses, all right, and if the faculty want you to do that, uh, I think that's also problematic. Um, it's probably not impossible. The only problem is that with the, it depends on the level of blackboard that you're running. Uh, we just run the first level. We run the first level, not the system, not the, uh, the portal level. And it, the problem with it, as I see, is that it also give you rights into the classrooms for every other school on campus, and I think that's problem, that's problematic. In the back row, very corner. You said that you didn't want to be tied to a particular vendor, uh, mm -hmm. thus establishing reasons why you brought it in-house. How does bringing it in-house not tie you to a particular vendor? All right. Um, what I meant was that I didn't want to be tied to a specific legal research vendor. All right, that's what I meant. Um, we we walk the line between Lexus and Westlaw, as most of you do. Yes? Um, I was just going to comment on this question that was asked just before this one. We have a university-created um, course management system mm -hmm. that we use. And with our system, I have been given administrative rights to the law mm -hmm. folder so to speak, of that that software. So I have, I can access all of our faculty, um, we call it on course, um, all of our faculty accounts there. And I do that just as a support person. So, um, I mean, I, that's how I can assist them on training. I mean, I have to have some level of, of access in order to be able to direct them and, and work with them. Right? Exactly. I really have not had any faculty member object to my being able to come in and help them. Most of them see that as a positive. What they don't simply don't want is someone who some, has no particular question or relationship to their course uh, inside it. Um, without wanting to put too fine a point on it, uh, when you are in, when you're looking at the way that someone teaches, all right, there's enough trust between me and the faculty that if I were calling about something, they would take that as positive. I'm not so sure, for example, that if our dean of students had blanket um, uh, admissions, and this is this is, and our dean of students is a lovely woman, but on the other hand. I'm not sure that the faculty would take her comments about, I don't think that you should be giving out this assignment less than 48 hours before it's due. All right, that's not her business. And that's what we're talking about, that the faculty doesn't particularly want. Yes? Uh, is that the kind of problem when you're spot checking that you would talk to a faculty member about, how they made their assignments? Usually, when I'm spot checking, what I'm looking for are things that haven't worked. When a faculty member thinks they've loaded a document and it's not there, or that they've loaded it in a format at which the students can't open it, or that the faculty member has loaded something that heaven help us is 100 pages long. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, it's, it's those sorts of practical things that I'm looking for. I never, ever tell a faculty how to teach. <coughs> ever. With the result that some of them ask me, Sometimes, if there's a better way. Yes? If you have or had some more experienced faculty members who either are capable of the more sophisticated web authoring tools, such as the front page or anything, or if they've grown to prefer Twin, mm -hmm. then they have the freedom to do that. Absolutely. And not be black. Absolutely. As I said, I never dictate. We never mandated. But what happened was that faculty who were using twins, students started complaining that there were that they were having to access two different systems 
And so I have faculty that were using twin who actually came over the system that most of the, the faculty were using for student convenience. Uh, I would never have told them to make that switch. Uh, we have two faculty members who use Blackboard for one thing, but also have course websites that Blackboard actually serves as a portal to. So that uh, I am not about to say that someone who's invested a great deal of time in doing something, both that they want their students to access and that they want the rest of the world to see, should not have the ability to do that. Do you support that? Yes, I do. Yes? Technical question. Uh, your user access methodology for Blackboard, does that utilize the uh, logon methodology that you use to get users on the network, or is it a separate user database? It's a separate user database. And that administrative uh, uh, work that creates that burden to your staff? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. However, however, um, I finally figured out a way. Uh, it's only, uh, it's, it is no more headache than adding the first year students every year. Uh, obviously, at the beginning of last year, it was a headache because we had to add all three years plus evening students. Um, we figured out a way how to, how to take the information out of Banner for course registrations so that we could load the course rosters uh, fairly easily. But uh, is, uh, is, it, it is using any, any online management system that is in-house more of an administrative burden? Absolutely. Otherwise, oh, anybody that with directory services such as Active Directory? Mm -hmm. I have a comment about uh, automating that one. By campus, why we are using WebCD, and it pulls the, the registration database and uh, gives out uh, account numbers and uh, everything based on the post registration. So you don't have to do anything extra for that. So probably you could try that one with Blackboard. We, okay, if we used a higher level of Blackboard, and I was willing to have us run through the campus Blackboard, <coughs> we could do that without a problem. Our decision to keep the manner in which our clinics are using Blackboard in-house we understood was going to have more of an administrative issue composed with it. But to us, as I said, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Maryland's clinics. We have an absolutely huge clinical program. Um, we have uh, 25 dedicated clinical professors. And we, so what the clinic does is it drives a lot of what we do. And to me, uh, making sure that our uh, professionals do not run afoul of any of the licensing prohibitions <laughs> in the state of Maryland trumps everything. Okay, yeah. We, we've just implemented Blackboard and we're going through our campus system and we are able and have been able to hook into our registration process Terrific. so that courses are automatically populated through that process. It's, it, it, it works, it's much, much easier. Otherwise, one of your staff people will go mad. <laughs> How many staff do you have? Uh, all right. Uh, assigned to Blackboard, I have one full-time person uh, assigned to Blackboard. However, the IT person who is who staffs the student computer lab also can help students with it. And I have two student trainers who work with me. Yeah. Have you found much uh, need for student support? Yeah, um, initially, yes. Uh, but it's interesting, not so much with first year students. There are a lot of first year students who have used course management systems as undergraduates. Uh, where we find a crying need for it, we have a very large evening program that's composed of working professionals. And those, as a group, those people have needed more support, much more support. Um, this is a big one for me. Uh, I encourage the student, if a student comes to me and says, Professor so-and-so is putting things up on the system, uh, that, and uh, she's putting them up two hours before she expects us to have them ready in class, um, 
I encourage the student to talk to the faculty member first. My job is not to come between the professor and the class. I will speak to the faculty member if the student has been unsuccessful. That's the other trust issue. The faculty don't see me as an arbitrator or as any kind of a negotiator for the students. Okay. Okay, quick emergency help. Law students on call. Okay, they're the cheapest, best source of help around. Um, they are on call post 8 p.m. to midnight and again at 6 a.m. They're 24 hours beginning Sunday at 8, at 8 a.m. I have, uh, I have two students who do this in sort of in tag team. Because one of the things that we've discovered, obviously, if somebody reports a problem that is really a server problem, I or one of the IT people are going to show up. But most of the questions are, I can't print this document out. I can't, the, the kinds of questions that you get uh, on a weekend tend to be very low level questions. And there's no reason that students can't troubleshoot that. The, I think the most important thing for your school is to evaluate where your need is the highest. Look at the patterns of use. Um, you can already, if you have any sort of uh, tracking software for email as to when the most patterns are passed, look at other than 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, where the patterns of use are the highest. And that's when you should be supporting Blackboard or whatever system you're using. Uh, we put both frequently asked questions and troubleshooting tips online. And I think that's crucial. But when we cut down on emergency calls and student training, uh, what we did, and I simply did not have the staff to train every student. Uh, we offered the first two weeks of school uh, hour-long Blackboard sessions for groups. We trained intensively the first-year students during orientation. I discovered that the first-year students get it in less than half an hour. They don't have any problems. The biggest problem is getting them on and having them pick their own password and make sure that the email that they put in is accurate. The email address, that's about it. We also do that self-diagnostic booklets. What are the most frequent problems that people encounter? And we hand that out to all the students. Okay, student pressure. I think this is a big one in getting the faculty use it. Target certain classes. You know, don't target, uh, target classes that most students take. Offer an online meeting space to law review and new court board through Blackboard. Uh, faculty, listen to law review and to move court board. Again, we train the research and we train the teaching assistants. Okay, what I'm going to go through now is really quickly, is some ideas for ways in which our faculty are using Blackboard. And I think that one of the things that you're going to see is that very quickly it evolved from being just a place to post documents and post announcements. Uh, the other thing that our, that our particular faculty had as an issue is this idea that doing anything online is solitary, that it's not interactive. And so we tried to get through that as quickly as possible. Um, they do online, real-time office hours and makeup classes. Especially faculty who teach evening classes know that it's almost impossible to find evening space for a makeup class. So we've been able to work a way in Blackboard that they can do online, real-time makeup classes. Very, very popular, especially with the students. Uh, we find that between 5 and 7 p.m. on Sunday evenings is the preferred time for doing online makeup classes. Most students and most faculty seem to love it. Midterm quizzes and pre-testing. Uh, we find more and more that our faculty in the seminars uh, find that students have an unequal um, grasp of ideas when they first come in. And so we have faculty who actually do pre-testing to determine the level of class. It's part of the first day assignment. 
uh, Walker takes the answers by student, Blackboard uh, grades it and tells the faculty instantly who's having what problems and who knows what. Um, as I said, students keep their clinical laws when they work. Maryland has a mandatory clinical experience for all students. That's the other reason that our clinics are huge. And uh, that the students keep their journals, their logs, so that the faculty can access them at any time. Uh, a lot of our legal writing instructors do peer review of writing and drafting online. Uh, it's a gateway to faculty creative simulations. It also provides, as this gentleman asked up here, a gateway to other faculty websites that they use. It provides um, a gateway to the seminar specific library research guides. Uh, and I'm, I am really in awe of our librarians that they've managed to do this. For, because those research guides are done as pathfinders. And at the very end, it identifies the librarian who is responsible for working with this class. Gives them uh, his or her telephone number, email address, and a way to reach them. Really wonderful resource. Other ideas. Student consultation with outside experts, real-time chat. That's become a big one. Uh, the student consultation with both the librarian and the faculty in regard to a CERT paper in real time. Uh, the negotiation teams meeting in real time chat. Matter of fact, we have one negotiations professor who meets with both teams at the same time, coming back, going back and forth between them online. Uh, posting diagrams and class recaps as well as assignments and readings. Uh, remember I said that there was the professor who got high student marks on his course evaluations for the very first time for his organization. He started posting, when we started posting any diagram that he had written on the board up to Blackboard, and he did a one-page class recap of what he thought had gone on in class. <laughs> um, the students loved it. The students absolutely loved it. Now, I have checklists for everything that we did that are available at this website. So if you want to go to the website, it has, uh, rather than my printing out all of our booklets, everything is available there. It's all of our booklets, it's all of our checklists, and it's a list. We have about 200 ideas for the way the faculty are using online course management systems. Now, do you remember when I said that when I went home this afternoon, we were moving to our new facility? That means that right now, today, our servers are not working because they are in transit. So try after Tuesday, and they will be up and running again, she said, hopefully. Mm. Now, are there any questions? Yes, the woman in the back. Can you read that? I can't. OK. It's uh, www.law. Dot umaryland dot edu slash uh, ACAD tech and then slash Cali 2002. Uh, the other thing is if you go back to the root directory and surf around and the academic tech directory, you can see some of the other teaching tools that we use with the faculty. Yes. So in your experience then, from what, from what you said, it sounds like faculty don't have any problems moving into Blackboard in the course of the semester as opposed to at the beginning? It depends. Um, now that our faculty have seen what it can do, and now that we have student pressure saying, hey, why isn't your first day reading assignment up in Blackboard, um, they all move into it at the beginning. What I was saying was that I didn't push. I simply let the students and other faculty members bring them in. As a matter of fact, it was a little bit more, uh, why didn't you make me aware of this? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Well, right? let's do it now. Yes. In your presentation in the beginning, you said it was 100% effective use. How are you defining effective use? Uh, to me, effective use is when the faculty member uses it for more than just email or uses it for more than just posting announcements. Or right, when the faculty member is actually interacting with students online, I consider that effective. 
uh, when a faculty member gets positive comments related to the technology used for the course from students in their course evaluations, I consider that effective. I, I don't have access to student course evaluations, and I wouldn't. But I will tell you that I've gotten comments from over half of our full-time faculty on the course evaluations from spring saying that the student comments were positive. I consider that effective. Yes? On those course pages uh, for different professors, do you have uh, any course page just where some of the material is public access, like anybody in the world could see and... Uh, no. Uh, for that, what we have done is actually to create a shadow page that's a public web page. Our, our faculty have been almost uniform in wanting their own copyright kept and wanting their own. Our students don't even have access to their course pages once they finish the class. All right. Uh, oh, I should take that back. Uh, I usually keep them up for about three months because a lot of our faculty post sample answers to exam questions after the course is over uh, to those students in doctorate or make comments about the exam. Because I had a request from one professor to make it 100% accessible to the world. So <sighs> I think that um, I have not done that. Uh, I think that it's possible to do that. I think you can literally shadow a page and just make it a, a public page. All right. I, I, would, I would talk to the professor about what the consequences, not consequences of that work. Uh, some of the professors who originally told me that they want everything accessible to the world sometimes will come back later having done something that's accessible to the entire world and saying, no, they want it closed up. Yeah. You weren't concerned about having certain materials on a foreign server, right. backward server, so right. to speak. Would you still have made the choice to take over administration of it on your server, or would then you have preferred to have people register on backward server? Uh, we still would have made that choice. Uh, I trust our IT people. I trust the way that they manage a server. I don't know the people who run the commercial Blackboard server. It's what if something goes down and it's within our control to fix it. Number one, I have some belief that it's going to get fixed faster. I also believe that uh, our faculty trust that it will come back up faster with our own people. I just get very uncomfortable with having something in a distant server that's not under our control. And it's, what I'm saying is that the uh, the clinical issue was what made the decision for us, but I still probably would have made the same decision otherwise. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I hope you guys The site contains both my email address and my telephone number. I'd be happy to talk to anyone about my duties. The only thing is I'm going to say, wait another week before you call me, because I guarantee I just can do boxes for